You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Welcome to Smart Sex, Smart Love. We're talking about sex goes beyond the taboos and talking about love goes beyond the honeymoon. I'm Dr. Joe Court. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. And today on Smart Sex, Smart Love, I'm chatting about erotic empathy with my guest, Amanda Luderman. Amanda's just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of her private practice in Montreal, Canada, where she works as a psychotherapist with a special interest in the erotic dynamic of relationships. Her clinical work focuses on fostering optimal romantic relationships through her client's willingness to engage with imperfection and differences in relationships and prioritizing a connection with empathy, an approach and skill set she has developed called erotic empathy. We're going to look at what distinguishes erotic empathy from sexology or sex therapy. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, Joe. So nice to have you here. So long awaited. Um, I always, I'd love to just tell everyone how, uh, I mean, I think I knew you before that cab ride, but that's when I really got to know you. Uh, I think it was a, over a year ago. We were in a cab going to an Esther Perel <laughs> event, which we were all excited to do. And all of a sudden you in the back were talking to Rachel Needle and you said, um, erotic empathy. And my head turned around like Linda Blair, like what was that? Like those two words put together, I had never heard of. It's so simple, yet so complex. So I'm glad you're on the show to talk about it. Oh, I'm thrilled to be. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. I love it. So tell me, could you start with, um, what's erotic empathy? What is it? Okay, so, well, erotic empathy has has evolved um, over the course of the last few years. Um, mo- right now, most succinctly, it is a skill set. It's a skill set that I'm I'm offering um, that I've just recently most offered. Actually, Dr. Rachel Needle um, had had me uh, in West Palm Beach to offer a training for therapists. Um, so I'm offering it as a as a competence that therapists can can hone for their practices, whether, uh, specifically when they are not sex therapists, for example, to be able to dialogue concerns of eroticism more effectively and and um, and more uh, comfortably uh, when when working with couples. And it is also a term that I use when treating my clients, something that they can develop and hone within themselves, for themselves and for their relationships. I I like this. I I hope that couples and individuals listening who are in relationships can learn from you. But I didn't realize, and I wish I could have gone, that when you were at the training in West Palm Beach for Modern Sex Therapy Institutes, you were were actually introducing the skill set to therapists. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I'm hoping to, uh, I'm sort of right now honing it exactly as a, uh, a competency. So erotic empathy, uh, competence for, for a therapist, uh, not trained in sex therapy is, is really something on my, high up on my to-do list. I love the language, um, erotic empathy competency. I like what I heard you say once that you don't have to be a sex therapist to do, have uh, the skill of erotic empathy as a therapist working with clients. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the most, the way I begin talking about this is something I think most of us can relate to. You know, you've ever been watching TV with, let's say, a grandparent or a parent in the room and something sexual comes on. Somebody starts kissing somebody on the television. And that immediate feeling of, oh, that, that wincing sort of squirmy feeling you get of embarrassment, that whoever it is in the room with you is not somebody you want to think of you as a sexual person. And it's not somebody per se, that you want to think about as a sexual person, <laughs> <laughs> right? So that, that thing that happens when something sexual comes up um, is, is basically, and there are not so many topics, right, that do this, that make us think personally about ourselves. Sexuality is one of them. And so the best of therapists, you know, highly effective therapists, unfortunately, if they don't have experience dialoguing and navigating those intricate, awkward, sometimes very awkward conversations about sexuality might have that, that personal leaning, that slight little tinge of, of embarrassment that can come up when sexuality is mentioned. And so in session, it, you know, therapists um, are trained in empathizing and being objective about so many concerns that come up. So if you're talking about your workplace stresses, you're talking about illness, you're talking about financial stress, um, sibling rivalry, you mm, name it, mm-hmm. all those wonderful things that can come up you know, in, in, with, 
um, and, and are well treated in, in therapy, sometimes when sex comes up, the, the therapist might have that little push away reflex that can come up, you know, that for them personally, that it disables their capacity to empathize as they normally would across a very various other topics. So I really believe that if you, if compassion and empathy are within your toolbox um, as a therapist, then why not expand it to include specifically and quite distinctly um, this other area of empathy called erotic empathy, where you validate and include the unique experience of whomever's in front of you as a sexual being totally and completely distinct from yourself so without well, judgment mm -hmm. and with compassion. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. Um, I, you made me think about when I was in my early twenties, uh, I was, um, over my, uh, at a, my father's wife and I were watching a movie and a, and a sex scene came on. It was going to be a lengthy sex scene. You could tell. And she looked at me and she said, <laughs> one of us has to leave the room. Either I'm going upstairs or you're going upstairs to watch it somewhere else. And I, and I, I agreed, you know, because it was so uncomfortable for the two of us to be in the room and yeah. watch this. And you're right. That's the feeling that people get around this. Is that right? That's right. So in that moment, they, they feel personal. They feel that intimacy within themselves awaken. And in some, I think in some cases, quite frankly, you just may want to experience that sex scene. You just may want to know, like feel it and, and let it run over you. You know what I mean? Let's sort of let that, that gentle warm shower water of experience <laughs> just sort of enjoy the experience, make that part of what happens for you. And you can't if somebody in the room is either uh, at risk of judging you, uh, you're at risk of being judged, I should say, or, or you know, you're sort of interfering with something, um, it, you know, there's an interference, so to speak, between you and that other person when mm -hmm. it comes to being able to be present with yourself. And that is all too often also unfortunately happening in couples where people do love each other and they, they are attracted to each other, but there is this noise between them. There's this feeling that they're not fully acceptable. They're not fully received. Um, they're not able to really and truly be their authentic erotic selves. And that that's all kind of similar to that noise that would come up in an awkward family moment in front of the TV. You might as well be kind of drawing a similarity there in your couple. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, that judgment or that shame, it might be projected. Some people are not being judged, but they feel like they might be. And so e even if there isn't a high risk of it, it does need to be clarified, right? It does need to be brought into the couple session, for example, or to just the relationship and to say, how do you feel about me when I need that or when I want that? Is is this okay, right? Is it the, the proverbial am I normal mm -hmm. question as it comes up within the couple? You distinguish between eroticism and sexuality. Can you explain that on this show? Sure. Um, so sexuality, um, I, I describe as a essentially a diagnostic or medical word. Right? When we're talking about sexuality, people most often reflect upon function and dysfunction. Where, and, and it's often also located within one person's body. So when we're talking about the sexuality of a person or, you know, um, sexual experiences, we tend to be talking about each person's capacity for, for orgasm or for pleasure. Eroticism, I define as, uh, as really an interpersonal sexuality. It's, it's that capacity to evoke desire between uh, someone and something or between two people. Mm. So if I, look at a, if I look at a stiletto, you know, I kind of love shoes. If I look at shoes, I might say, oh, that's so sexy. Right, that that shoe, um, as a fetishistic object, ultimately evokes desire. It does something that stimulates a an interest as an erotic symbol. And and eroticism within the couple is so important because it means that we each want to instill a feeling of desire or sexuality, right? But a, a between each other. So eroticism is really the focus, actually, when you think about it, of the of erotic relationships. So that when we're looking at two people wanting to feel desired and desirable within the couple, that's, that's that flow, that erotic dynamic of relationships mm -hmm. is how successfully we're each able to call upon our own individual sexuality 
in each other's company. So maybe you could explain more because you wrote a great article on medium.com called I am carrot cake, a lesson in erotic empathy. And I thought it's great. And I share that in every one of my lectures and the, um, most of the, uh, the, the audience are women and they love it. Can you explain what you meant by I'm a carrot cake? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I am carrot cake. So oh. it's, a, it's, a, it's a cute thing. Uh, carrot cake evolved. Um, that article got written out of, um, a a little inspiration for my husband. He loves carrot cake. I don't. Um, And I, what I tend to say is that I don't like vegetables in my dessert. (laughs) Not really, it's not my thing. Um, But I certainly can appreciate that he enjoys it and I can support and enjoy his enjoyment of it without ever yucking his yum, you know, without ever telling him, ew, that's gross. Why do you like that? Uh, And that's, that's why I am carrot cake. I don't necessarily find myself to be appealing, um, you know, as, as he might, but as he does, but who am I to tell him that I'm not appealing? Who am I to tell him that he doesn't have the right to find me attractive um, and to enjoy me if I want him to enjoy me. Right. Yep. And so that, that's where uh, erotic empathy I think really got um, <laughs> sort of synthesized, you know, really captured. Um, in that way, erotic empathy is ultimately the ability to allow your partner to find you attractive. I defined in the article, even when you don't feel you are, it's that active, that practice of accepting that your partner can experience you in a light that you yourself do not have of yourself, you know, you do not have uh, or understand. And, it, and really allowing that to, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if I get home from the gym and I feel sweaty and gross. And my husband is sort of, you know, approaching me as though that is not his experience of me. Uh, one of the fault, one of the greatest errors I think that we make in long-term relationships is we reject our partner's initiative, uh, our our partners generally because we don't feel attractive. We don't have that active autophilia in the moment. So what and do you? So, you're gone. Yeah. No. So what, okay, so let's say you do. I, I've I had that experience, right? You come home, you're smelly, you're sweaty, and and then your partner's like, "God, I'm turned on. Let's do this." But you feel gross. How does this? How does erotic empathy work then? So the difference between erotic empathy and the classic um, no reflex of the moment is that erotic empathy says, "Let me let me adjust this moment to include the conditions I require to be able to feel erotically present." So in that moment, what did I need? And what I did was I gave him a kiss and I said, you know, I put my hand on his chest and I say, be right with you. I love that. Don't move. I need 12 minutes and I will go rinse off so that I can be within my experience of my own body in a way that's pleasant for me enough to then be present with him and to relax into it. If I don't feel I can enjoy my own body, um, it can be a distraction or a difficulty, uh, cause a difficulty to be present with him. And so those adjustments are really important. And oftentimes people don't realize that it can be subtle. They don't, they're not enormous adjustments. You don't have to leave the room and lose 50 pounds to come back and enjoy sex. Love it. You know, so right. You don't. And, and, you know, you don't have to adjust to, you know, tremendously. Oftentimes it's doing something that just decreases the feeling of self betrayal Mm -hmm. that you would have if you don't adjust. So had I just gone with it, while not feeling attractive, there might have been this part of me that says, but I don't really want this and I'm doing it because he wants it. And that reflex is one of the most important things to diminish in, in, in long-term relationships because the more you do something that you're not really on board with, the more you ultimately are demotivating the desire to initiate sex across time. Say what you mean by that. What does that mean, that last part? Yeah, so if you, you know, when you do something you don't like doing, then the next time that same stimulus comes up, mm-hmm. um, you're probably going to have a little bit of an, uh, a little disappointment or a little bit of a, but I didn't want to last time feeling. Mm-hmm. And that distinct disappointment, which I, I call the, those are self-betrayal um, risks. So, you know, something, if you're afraid to say no, because you don't want to hurt someone else's feelings. And so you overwrite your own feelings. That's called that self-betrayal. You're in a relationship with yourself that tells you 
you are less important than whomever else is there oh, with you. I Oh, my God. I'm telling you, I just love this. Because really, when people think of erotic empathy, when I say it, they think of, oh, having empathy for my partner. But you're describing it, yes, and empathy for oneself and not to betray Absolutely. oneself. That's really well said. Thank you. So then – uh, oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I think just that, you know, that there is a, a bit of an absence of relationship with the self in, in a lot of focuses on the clinical focus on the couples. We're looking at sexual functioning, you know, mechanics sometimes, um, histories of trauma without necessarily looking at the residual impacts of all those things on each person with themselves in the company of the person they love. Mm hmm. So how does this relate? Because I see a lot of couples that come through my office, heterosexual, so I'll say um, mixed sex, right? One male, one female, primarily heterosexual. And um, she finds his porn and she has a disgust response to what she has found and actually even mm -hmm. thinks that he's – it's like cheating on her. And so mm -hmm. how would how then would your model help this couple negotiate the fact that he's been looking at something that she is vehemently against and actually disgusted by? Okay. Yeah, actually, well, I can tell you this is very, very, very common. Um, and it, those kinds of concerns are first and foremost rooted in the fear that what our partners are looking at in porn um, is, is ultimately in direct contrast to what we offer them as opposed to um, in addition to what we offer them. Mm. I think that's so empathizing. When I think about erotic empathy, we think about it being inclusive of, remember that whole, that unique and valid erotic experience of each person in a relationship. So each person in a relationship has a plethora, a wide variety often of, in, of things that interest them, sexually speaking. Mm -hmm. And we in couples are not, in relationships are not necessarily everything that our partners find attractive. We are some of what our partners find attractive. And so we, yet our insecurities within ourselves individually often speak to needing to be um, everything and how, or, or the fear of being inadequate or the fear of losing desire, our partner losing desire in us uh, for us across time. I can tell you about a couple just last week um, that I worked with where, you know, she identifies with having, um, she says, very cute, but very small breasts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and she says, and one day I was using the laptop and I came across a search history. And I said, with honestly open-mindedness, um, all right, I want to see what he looks at. And she looked and noticed that the recent videos were all of larger breasts. Mm -hmm. And she thought, Oh, it, she felt immediately overcome by this sense of just huge betrayal. You mm -hmm. know, she just said right away, she felt angry. She said, if you didn't, if you liked larger breasts, then why didn't you leave me for somebody who would find me to be the, the hottest? You know, why, why do I feel like you're settling now for who I am and what I look like? Um, and she felt totally disgusted with the fact that he was looking at all this stuff that looks, looks nothing like her, mm -hmm. for example. Yes. And, and then, you know, what he needed the space to be able to, to say to her, he needed to be able to, to, to include um, what I thought was actually a really precious response. He said to her, if you had large breasts, I probably would be looking at small breasts on the internet. <laughs> right, exactly. Isn't that precious? Yes. And the fact is, he says, what I love is enthusiastic looking sex from people with breasts. And <laughs> so that kind of, it really was about the fact that it's a yes and yeah. response and not a this or that either or, you know, um, competing stimulus. That was really beautiful. So they actually did have a very safe, erotically empathic conversation wherein even though she has insecurities that preexist her being with him, uh -huh. right, that say her breasts are inadequate and those kinds of things, she actually has a sibling who, who um, got breast enhancing surgery. And so, you know, there's been a lot of that topic in her life. And can you imagine, I mean, she just suddenly, all her insecurities were validated by this search history she found. Yeah. So the erotic, the erotic empathy piece is about her willingness to include his total erotic um, uh, repertoire, if you will. The experience of that which instills desire in him is far more inclusive than she had previously thought and feared. Mm -hmm. And that really worked out well for them. And 
what you're talking about when it comes to disgust, if I, if I get you right, mm-hmm. is, is what happens when, when your partner's looking at something that you actually can't wrap your head around being arousing at all. So like she understands the large breasts are arousing um, to him. And so she just fears not being able to embody that for him. Right. Mm-hmm. But what happens when he's looking at, let's say, you know, the classic stuff would be um, let's say multi-partner anal sex, rough, stuff, BDSM, you name it, whatever's sort of escalated his, uh, you know, his sensations while watching porn that he doesn't necessarily need with his partner and, and that she feels just totally horrified by seeing. And in that case, we again want to understand the sensations he experiences, what that's about for him, when emotionally also he's looking at that stuff. Is it out of boredom? Is it out of a seeking that psychological charge to, to quicken arousal that can happen when you look at porn? Um, that is not, as we know in the literature, right? Not synonymous with what people desire in real life. Right. Right. And, no. and that's a discussion um, that does, I think is really helped in therapy. I think people do really well in those discussions and couples work where we talk about the fact that what you're looking at online allows you that quicker, more effortless experience of psychological escalation of erotic sensations that doesn't necessarily need to take place in the same way when you're having sex with someone in person. Do you think there's um, a... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Do you, nope. think, do you think there's an equivalent to to males having the similar response to females in mixed sex relationships? When because uh, this is usually what I see the the women being um, you know having a reaction to the porn, but what about the men and having them having erotic empathy? Yes, so um, a lot of times women, particularly women who have uh, difficulty bringing forth their sexual desire, um, the flow of their desires. Like for example, when a woman suddenly wants sex more than her husband does or her partner does. Um, In a heterosexual relationship, there's a lot of shame when women begin to feel like their man is not initiating as often as they used to. Mm -hmm. And women, we know that across time, women begin to feel more comfortable with their sexual urges uh, after, let's say, their 30s, whereas in their 20s, in some cases, they're waiting to be the subject of the male desire. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting upon the initiatives of the male and, you know, starting it up and, and receiving where, uh, you know, as the subject of arousal, feeling comfortable and validated in those instances, but they're not as much as, as likely to go after the sex that they want in their 20s. Whereas as women age, I think we get a little bit more era, sort of like, this is what I want, you know, where are you? <laughs> and, and going after yeah. it. And, and that actually can cause shame if it's not received well, right? And so the fantasy that I, I hear about a lot is women really being desired and taken by multiple men, for example, you know, being that, that subject of desire as it decreases in their, their relationship might show up as them watching, um, like gangbang style narratives Mm. in, in porn. When a man discovers that a woman is watching out there, you know, watching, um, what their woman wants to watch, which is, you know, them being taken by multiple men, it can sometimes give them, throw them back and say, whoa, 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 you want what? or changes their view of, you know, their, uh, quote unquote, respected partner before that. And, and that's really, that can be very upsetting. A woman doesn't want to feel her man loses respect for her because she fantasizes being the subject of desire mm-hmm. uh, by multiple men, right? Yeah. That's a fantasy. Yeah. You are one of the few people in this field, I have to tell you, and I mean this with all my heart, who wake my brain up. You, my brain just comes alive and starts. It's completely awake when you talk about these things because they're they're not. You're not saying it in typical ways that we talk about it in therapy. You're saying it. You're configuring words and sentences and concepts. Really, it's in the spirit of Esther Perel. I really mean that in your work, and that your work is going to come with a skill set is even better. I wish that I had the intelligence to do that. I feel like I do a lot of good work, but I don't have a skill set to give people and. That you're going to bring that to to therapists is invaluable. Wow! Wow! Whew, I just got chills. I mean it. I mean it. Ever since I met you, I just feel this way, <laughs> and I wouldn't say it if I didn't. Because, and I was looking forward to the show. And I know that Modern yeah. Sex Therapy Institute's uh, videotapes their um, their uh, speakers. So yours was recorded, right? It could be. It could be. Uh, it was good. Yes, it's on their site. So if you go, to- one of the things about the skill set, I think, is really cool. I spoke with somebody right after the talk um, that illuminated something for me I hadn't thought about um, was, you know, I said things I thought maybe 
I feared rather are were were obvious and and I'm really happy I included some of these thoughts. And yeah. You know when you include a couple of slides sort of as an afterthought in a presentation thinking, yeah, all right, I'll throw that in. Yep. Um, I included things like use um, casual language, mm-hmm. but use it professionally. That's one of the skills within erotic empathy is not to stay formal and clinical. So I don't necessarily only refer to, um, you know, penetrative intercourse or for something like that. You know, I will often use the language that the clients are using mm-hmm. after requesting their consent to repeat those words. Because mm-hmm. sometimes people say things that they're comfortable saying, but not comfortable hearing back. So, I'll, I'll just make sure that they're comfortable with me using words, like let's say blowjob instead of oral sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will just, when I say I use casual language professionally, it means we're, we're using and creating a safety around how people actually think about their sex lives. Um, and that's what's really important too. So that, that, that'll come across in the whole erotic empathy approach is being real <laughs> and, and yes. talking about things in a way that the, I, I'd like to think is a nice extension of how people actually think about themselves sexually and talk about the nuances around of eroticism and that that flow of energy between people without being too clinical i don't want to come across obviously with with that purely academic um i have a side of me too and love that nerdy part of me but i, I think when we're in the room with people we got to be like genuinely present with them and meet them where they're at absolutely so amanda where can people find you online um, so erotic empathy, uh, social media and the website are now launched. They are in their rudimentary stages, but they're there. So that's on Instagram and, uh, as erotic empathy at erotic empathy. And the website is erotic empathy.com. Um, my personal email, I always welcome questions and concerns. I'm, I'm super accessible that way. It's a Luderman, that's a L U T E R M A N at erotic empathy.ca for the website. I am in Canada. And um, where else? Otherwise, Amanda Luderman uh, is the rest of my social media, everything like Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, uh, Amanda Luderman uh, can be reachable as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Too short, but really well. Uh, like, I think this was intense and had a lot of good information and maybe we'll have you back and maybe there'll be part two. So thank you for being on the show. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smart Sex, Smart Love. I'm Dr. Joe Court, and you can find me on joecourt.com. That's J-O-E-K-O-R-T.com. See you next time.